Go to Psalm 119. It has 176 verses. We're going to preach on every one of them today. <laughs> After all these years, you learn a couple of things about ministry. And one thing is, don't drag on sermons too long. Uh, actually, we do have a, a business meeting today following this service. We'll be letting out of here at about 20 after 10. We're going to go up to the fellowship hall so we can vote on our budget. We missed our quorum by just a few people a couple weeks ago. And uh, if you want to get up to fellowship hall by the elevator, just go to the elevator, hit level E, you'll be right there. And we'll start that as soon as we can get everybody upstairs and people who are coming in uh, for the business meeting. You know, most of us or a lot of us are watching a lot of football. Buckeyes were on the other night. And uh, there's some elements that are critical to how a football team functions. Obviously, it's the head coach and coaching staff all have to be on the same page. And then there's the, the uh, tenor of the locker room. The players themselves have to be in community. They have to be on the same page with, with each other. But there's another piece of that puzzle that often doesn't really register with us. It's kind of off our radar screen, which is the playbook that the players have. And nothing that the team does on the field can happen apart from the playbook and the, the team coalescing around that playbook at the start. If they're not on the same page of the playbook, and if they don't know the playbook, nothing can happen on the football field. If a player is on the offensive line is a left tackle, that player has to know when the call is made at the line of scrimmage, if it's a screen pass, he knows he has to protect the quarterback's blind side, and he's got to let that, that uh, defensive end kind of think he's got the better end of it to pull him in so they can throw the screen pass over top. But if the line, call to the line of scrimmage is a deep pattern, that left tackle knows I've got to protect, and I've got to protect no matter what it costs me from that quarterback. It all hinges on everybody knowing what the play is and what the responsibility is, which is found in the playbook. And this year, as we uh, are using as our theme, Elevate, and there's four pieces to that, the first one, the one that's the most critical, is the piece we're calling the Word of God. And that's why we're today in Psalm 119. How can we elevate our lives spiritually by the Word of God? Two things that make Psalm 119 so impressive. Uh, what I would consider to be the grandest, most majestic of all the Psalms in the Bible. That's a pretty big claim to make because Psalm 23 is the one everybody knows. Uh, Psalm 139 is the one that we, as an anchor for our view of right to life and that life begins at conception. So what makes Psalm 119 so special? Why am I saying it's the grandest, most majestic of all the Psalms in the Bible? Well, it has 176 verses and the psalm, if you're looking at your Bible, probably is, should be broken down by section because it's the poet who wrote it sectioned it off. And it's sectioned into 22 different sections of eight verses apiece. Uh, now, what happens here, and it's really, the reason I put this up there is to give you a feel for the beauty of this psalm, is each of the 22 sections corresponds to one of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And actually, it works its way through the alphabet from the beginning to the end. So section number one in your Bibles, if you're looking at it, probably has a heading, and the heading says Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, corresponds to our letter A. Every sentence in that first section, there's eight sentences, every sentence begins with a word that starts with the letter Aleph. Every single sentence. When you move on to section number two, which is the Hebrew letter Baith, corresponds to our letter B, uh, every sentence of the eight sentences in that section starts with a word that begins with a letter B or Baith. And it's like that in every section moving through that psalm. So just the structure itself uh, gives it a majesty that rises above the other psalms in the Bible. But there's another reason. And as the theme through this psalm, 176 verses, by far the longest chapter in the Bible. There's not even a close second. The theme, almost in every sentence, is God's word. Now, the poet uses different uh, synonyms for God's word. It'll use words like commands, law, precepts, statutes, uh, uh, things like that. There's eight of them. But they're all different nuances 
for the larger word of God's word. God's given us his word. And so Psalm 119, all 176 verses have one theme. And it's the word of God and its importance in our lives. So we're going to focus in on that this morning. So if you have Psalm 119 in hand, we're going to start first in verse 14. Uh, now, the, the, we're, I'll show you at the end here in a little bit the various topics that are addressed in Psalm 119. We can't address all of them. Gosh, there's like 20. But again, the thing that links them is that what God's word says about each of those topics. So the poet, uh, for us this morning, is going to stand uh, before us and he's going to plead his case. He's going to, with all the power that he can muster, urging us to elevate our lives upon the word of God. That's his point. He's saying here in Psalm 119, you can't go anywhere spiritually in your life without starting first with the word of God. It begins there. Any more than a football player can dress up and go out on the field for the first play from scrimmage and not know the playbook. That's the point the writer is making, the poet's making in Psalm 119. So his first, well not the first, just one of them, one of many, and I'm just calling it the first, is the poet is saying that God's word, let's go on to the next slide, is like, is like winning the lottery. The value of God's word is like winning the lottery. Okay, Psalm 119, verse 14. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. So the poet is saying, when I follow what you tell me to do, Lord, when I follow, to do, follow that, that's the equivalent of myself stumbling into great wealth, or what I'm calling winning the big lottery. That as I orient my life around what God tells me to do, it's the equivalent of stumbling into more money than you could possibly imagine having. I've, at, at different times, I'm sure you've done this. You're sitting with a group and you're asking, okay, if, let's say the big lottery is $100 million. What would you do if you won the big lottery? So we'll do that. You go to friends. I have a friend that if he won a lottery like that, he told me the first thing he would do is hire a driver. I said, what are you talking about? I hate driving. I can't stand driving. I would hire a driver. I wouldn't care what kind of house I lived in. I just want someone to drive me from A to B. Often you hear athletes will say, professional athletes, that the first thing they did on their contract was to buy a house for their mom or buy a house for their mom and dad. I was listening this morning on the way in there, interviewing uh, Russell uh, Wilson, the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, about his life. And he started a foundation. The foundation is called Why Not You, when he fell into a big contract. The poet here is saying that God's word for us, when we follow it, when we open it up and we're saying, God, what are you telling me to do in this situation? Whether it's a relationship, money, decision I've got to make, problems at work, uh, struggles in my heart. The poet says, when I orient myself around what it says here, that's the equivalent of the feeling you would have if you stumbled on one day into a lottery ticket that gave you $100 million. That's what the word does when we follow it. Well, the poet offers us another thought. Let's go over to verse 54. These themes are found multiple places in this, in this poem. I'm just highlighting one verse. There's many verses that make the same point. Verse 54. The poet is saying that God's word was the theme of his life no matter where he lived. Verse 54. Your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge. So the poet is saying here, no matter where I've moved to and from, I live in this place, we have to pack up and move to that place. Maybe it's because famine forced us out and we had to go to a place where the famine hadn't hit. Uh, maybe uh, we've encountered some kind of calamity in our personal life and we've got to move and get a new start. He's saying... Wherever I went in my life and established my house, my residence, 
your law, your word, your decrees were the theme of my song wherever I lived. He's saying that no matter where I was, the common element uh, living in Columbus versus, say, Cincinnati, or moving from Cincinnati to Boston, or going from Boston to Tampa, wherever I go, he's saying, the common thread in my life is God's word. Not my job, not my good fortune, not my, even my family. It's God's word. That becomes the link. That becomes the anchor for my life, no matter where I am. The poet offers us another thought on God's word. So let's go to verse 103. And if you've noticed, as we move through here, we're, we're landing in different sections of this poem. And each section there corresponds to a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's how we kind of organized it. For the poet, God's word, he says, is sweeter than honey. Verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So I'm sitting at Bob Evans. Do you want biscuits, rolls, bread? You know, they ask you that. I want biscuits. I want extra butter, and I want plenty of honey. I sit that biscuit down, I cut that baby in half, and I use a lot of butter. On my biscuits and pancakes, I lather it on. And then I take the honey, and I just, just pour and pour and pour, and then I let it soak. I let it sit, and when that's the butter and the honey soak into that biscuit, it's what he's saying there about God's word. That God's word in my soul is like honey is in my taste buds. It just is a festival. (laughs) It's a party. He says that's what God's word is like. And he's saying this as a man looking back on his life. Because there's some hints in the psalm that um, he's he's got some wear on the tires. You, you kind of get that. It's not, this isn't someone early in life. This is someone later in life reflecting. And he's looking back on his life and he's saying, God's word, his decrees, his direction, his saying, go this way, has had the role in my life of being sweeter than honey is when I have that to eat. That's what God's word did. Now, I'm going to show you here on the next slide some of the topics that he covers in this psalm. And this is why he found God's word so meaningful to him. Things like purity, priority, relationships. He knew what it was like to be ambushed by someone in a relationship that you didn't see coming. He knew what that was like. He knew what it was like for, to deal with people who do evil things or people who hurt you, enemies who, who wound you deeply. Uh, he knew what it was like to be lied about to have gone through very serious suffering. God's silent moments. He talks about that in the psalm of God, where are you? I'm not hearing anything. I wonder when are you going to show up again? And those experiences, the thing that anchored him was this book, God's word, and he likened it to see something like eating a biscuit saturated with honey and what that's like for your taste buds. He said, that's what God's word has been like for me in my life. It's as sweet as that. So we want to elevate God's word in our lives. And I'm going to ask you to do something in January. As I thought about ways we could apply this, uh, you know what, if you, if you ask people to lay down, because I know it's true with me, if I ask people to lay down a goal for God's word for 2018, man, by February, we can't even remember what we wrote. And I'm that way, too. What can we do here in January to elevate God's word in our lives? And if we do that in January, maybe it'll stick. And it's there in February, in March. Well, we have these booklets. They're called 30 Days to a More Resilient Faith, Embracing the God of the Storm. There's one per day, anchored around the scriptures that you'd read. 
to help you in your faith. And the point of these, we're going to ask, we got them in the lobby for a $3 donation. If you don't have $3, we want you to have one. We don't want that to be a problem, but the $3 donation. And the point of this is not, oh, I, only, I missed it a couple times during a month and feel like you blew it. It's to take this perspective. However often I do it, I'm ahead if I had not done it. Even if I only do it five times, I'm ahead over having not done it for those five times. So Barb Wooler, who is a missionary that we support, uh, is the author of this, and she uh, uh, co-wrote it with a colleague named Wayne Hanna. Barb wrote the devotionals. And she stopped by our church a couple weeks ago, and I asked her to just share with us what was on your heart when you wrote this book, 30 Days to a More Resilient Faith, Embracing the God of the Storm. And this is what she said. My name is Barb Wooler. I'm the Director of Crisis Response for Encompass World Partners, and I'm also one of your global associates. I'm probably the only one in the room that realizes that this year, 2018, is our 20th anniversary of serving together in global missions endeavors. Uh, we've done a lot of cool things in the past 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, Sylvia Totsky was going around the church at Eastside and, and recruiting people to help us um, with uh, coloring literacy charts for the CAR. And that was just the first of many really cool projects we've done together. Uh, so um, we're actually working on another really cool project for the next 30 days, Lord willing. Um, Wayne Hanna and I put together a, a book, a devotional, 30-day book called 30 Days to a More Resilient Faith, Embracing the God of the Storm. And we wrote this out of a deep desire to strengthen believers, to understand what God is doing uh, through crises, through suffering, through pain, through loss in our lives. And so that's why we put this devotional together. Um, and if you're willing, for the next 30 days, we'll spend each day five to ten minutes together just considering some of the rich truths of God's Word on this really important subject. Barb is referencing there, it was 20 years ago, I think, that we began supporting her. And she served for many years in the Central African Republic, uh, planting churches among the pygmy people that our own Grace Brethren churches in the CAR were ignoring over some uh, cultural issues that were, uh, that were racial in, in their nature. They didn't, the people of the city just didn't do anything with the pygmies. And so Barb went into the jungle and started, I think it was five churches. Now is her primary mission. Now she's stateside for most of the year, and she uh, leads Grace Brother Churches to respond to crises at different places in the world. So we're sending a team to Puerto Rico uh, later this month to help rebuild a church building that was blown apart by the hurricane uh, that hit them. So that's what she does now. Well, they penned this book, 30 Days to More Resilient Faith, Embracing the God of the Storm, so that's what I'm asking you to do as part of Elevate 2018 about the Word, that you take one of those and use it in January. And again, it's, it's not, oh, I missed three times or I missed seven times. It's, well, I did it 27 times or I did it 20 times, which is more than what I would have done had I not. That's the perspective. So we invite you to take one of these in the lobby. Again, there are Three dollars. If you have three dollars, if not, we just want you to have this. So, as a church, uh, we'll be doing that then for January as a way to elevate our faith by the Word of God. And who knows how that practice over the next thirty days could stick in February and stick in March and April and on after having done it in January. So that's what we're going to ask you to do. So we want to pray now and uh, commit ourselves to elevating our faith by the Word of God in 2018. And you can get one of these uh, booklets at the, in the information area in the uh, lobby at the Hub. And when we're done, we're going to go upstairs to our fellowship hall, and we'll start our business meeting uh, shortly after that. So let's pray. Lord, I love that image in Psalm 119 where he described or likened the word, your word, to the sweetness of honey. That having experienced a lot of different things in his life, 
difficulties, suffering, times where it seemed like you were silent, being ambushed by people. Looking back, he could say that your word for him was sweeter than honey. It was like having unbelievable wealth just dropped in our lap. What a cool thing, Lord, that we as a church over the next 30 days can be all doing the same thing and elevating our faith by the word of God. That you would, that we would see in our lives what the poet of Psalm 119 saw, that sweetness that comes from your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.